<laughs> okay, can everybody hear me okay? Is the mic loud enough? Okay, so my presentation is called Normal Hearing Thresholds in the VA. So many clinicians report visits from patients who have normal audiometric thresholds, but report having some level of hearing difficulty. A survey administered to VA audiologists reported that 92% of them report seeing at least one such patient per month, 53% report seeing one to three, and 39% seeing, report seeing at least four. So this problem is well known to exist and has been acknowledged by both clinicians and researchers. We know that audiologic thresholds alone are not a foolproof predictor of how well a person will do in various listening environments. Patients that have normal hearing thresholds but uh, difficulties hearing have been classified into many different groups across the years. Um, some of these names include king kopetsky syndrome, obscure auditory dysfunction, or more recently, hidden hearing loss. Diagnoses seen more frequently in the veteran population um, include auditory processing disorder. Thank you, Amy, for that nice segue. <laughs> um, traumatic brain injury, and also PTSD. So the hearing difficulties that these patients experience are often reported as difficulties hearing in background noise or to rapid or degraded speech. So the prevalence of this population and the sources for their problems are not well understood. Past studies have reported a wide range of self-reported hearing difficulties despite normal thresholds, and this number ranges from 12 to 60%, and these numbers were collected in the general population, so not people in audiology. So while this normal hearing group comprises a really substantial portion of audiologic visits, there are no true standards of care for these patients. Um, one study showed that a diagnosis of normal hearing to someone who reports having hearing difficulties leads to feelings of dismissal and confusion. Current treatment options are often rooted in effective counseling, and some, of the, some clinicians also fit these patients with low to mild gain hearing aids, a personal FM system, or implement an auditory training program. However, the effectiveness of each one of these treatment options is still debated. So what we see overall is that the profession as a whole doesn't know exactly how to handle these patients. So we set out to answer the general question, how important is the issue of audiologists having to diagnose and treat people with normal hearing? So we aim to do this in two ways. First, by answering the question, what is the prevalence of normal hearing individuals visiting an audiology clinic in the VA? And what are the rates of abnormal audiologic measurements within this population? This analysis was performed with audiometric data from the DALC VA repository, and this includes information from 259 VA sites from around the country. So anybody that's had a placement at the VA, it's the data that when you enter in the thresholds that's sent for ordering hearing aids and stuff like that, that's the data that we analyzed. Um, so we analyzed all of the data that's in a typical battery as well as age at the time of the test. So here's an outline of the inclusion of patients in the study. So you can look at the graph starting from the top, and then the boxes with the blue text are uh, the people that we removed from the study. So in short, you can see that we started with over 3 million audiograms. It was given to us in nine Excel documents um, <laughs> with like many columns and many, many rows. Uh, and after we excluded people based upon age, date of evaluation, and non-normal hearing thresholds, we reduced our final analysis group to 235,091 patients. So all of the information moving forward is looking only at this group of patients, so we're not looking at the 3 million anymore, we're only looking at this 235. So the intent to classify the audiologic profile of people with normal hearing became more difficult after we started to discuss what the definition of normal hearing was. So in searching for a definition, I read a lot of the literature and I talked to a lot of professionals in the field, and it became really clear that a lot of people have an idea of what normal hearing is. They have an idea of what the upper limits are, but there's really not agreement across sources or across individuals. So we worked to track down the early sources of the definition. Um, and we'll start by looking at this scale that's on the left side. So in the 30s, there was a survey conducted, and uh, it was trying to figure out what the audiometric zero was. So the survey data was used to form the 1951 ASA scale, which is seen on the left side of the graphic. And with this study, normal hearing was defined as three standard deviations away from audiometric zero. So soon after the scale was developed, an organization in Europe, the ISO, found that their audiometric zero was 10 dB lower. Um, so as you can see, there's a discrepancy of about 10 dB when you're looking across the two scales. So according to one source, some organizations in the U.S. were resistant to adopting the ISO standards because they felt that a decrease in what the level of normal hearing was considered to be would increase compensation commissions. So instead of moving the definition of normal to 15, TB, to 15 dB, which 
represents the three standard deviations away from audiometric zero. The definition of 15 to 26 dB was considered to be the upper limits of normal hearing. So we see this definition as about negative 10 to 25 um, very frequently in, in clinics and in research. So this is the definition that we decided to use. Um, some researchers define normal hearing as some sort of hear tone average. Some people use the better ear, some people use the worst ear. Uh, but we decided to define it at all thresholds, um, all active thresholds in both ears. So this table includes all of our definitions of abnormal test results. Um, and we sort of ran into the same problem where there are a lot of normative studies done and there's a lot of different definitions of normal. So we attempted to use well-supported and common definitions that were applicable to our patient population. Okay, so in order to understand how frequently audiologists encounter this patient population, uh, we first determined a prevalence number, number of normal hearing patients visiting an audiology clinic, which was approximately 10% of all people in the data. So this number is actually similar to some reports that we've seen in the civilian population. So we know that these visits are not only occurring in the VA. Okay, so now we're gonna move into the results. Okay, so these are the mean thresholds for everybody included in our study. Uh, the shaded green area represents our definition of normal. Um, and it's really important to remember that this range encompasses 35 dB. So it's still really possible for abnormalities to exist within this range. Um, and these abnormalities can be different configurations or even shift in hearing. So this chart shows the mean thresholds plotted by age. You can see that the age spread is, is really quite good. And it validates what we know, that generally hearing thresholds increase as a population ages. So our age range was 19 to over 90 years old, but we aggregated those that were 70 and older into one group to ensure accuracy in the numbers that were reported. Uh, because you can see in our distribution, the people in the 70 plus group is starting to get pretty small. Um, but the number on the y-axis are in thousands. And so what we see here is that the people in the study were generally younger because these are the people that still have completely normal thresholds. So here's a scatter plot of 235,091 <laughs> data points. <laughs> so it's the age funneled against a high frequency pure tone average of one, two, and four. Uh, so first of all, I think this is a really good representation of how much data that we're dealing with. I mean, I can say this number and over and over again, but it's, it's really hard to imagine. Uh, but it also shows the concentration of better hearing towards the younger ages. So the frequency of each test being performed first helps us to understand the data, but also gives us um, information about the standards of care for normal hearing patients. So we can see that word recognition is very frequently performed at 92%, uh, but bone conduction was performed about 30% of the time, tympanometry 65, and reflexes were performed about 20, 26 to 37% of the time. So with advancing research in patients that have normal hearing thresholds, um, but may have hearing difficulties, a comprehensive test battery should be performed, especially if there are subjective reports of difficulty hearing, or if the test could better help the clinician understand uh, the patient's audiometric profile and the reason for their visit. So this figure shows how frequently the test is being performed, and that's the gray bar. And then the blue portion that's plotted on top of it is how many of these tests are abnormal. So you can refer to the table on the left here to see how frequently the tests were abnormal. So reflexes had the highest rates of abnormal results from about 15 to 25%. Uh, TIMPs were abnormal 19% of the time, and uh, word recognition and airborne gap were abnormal 2% of the time. Okay, so now we're gonna look a little bit more at audiometric notches. So here we see how often notches are occurring under four different conditions, with all octave frequencies being at or better than 25 dB. So on the x-axis, it lists the notch condition. So for example, this first one that says 248 is a four kilohertz notch with adjacent frequencies at two and eight. So we looked at right ear notches, left ear notches, and bilateral notches. Um, for the three and six kilohertz condition, the center frequency didn't necessarily have to fall within 25 dB. Um, and we'll get into that a bit more later, but our inclusion criteria was only that they had to be normal at the active frequencies. So we found the highest rate of notches in the four kilohertz condition, and then the second highest rate of notches in the six kilohertz condition. We also see that left ear notches are more common than right ear notches. So here are the mean thresholds plotted for those that had a notch at four kilohertz. Um, and this notch configuration is present entirely within the normal range. So the y-axis is only from five to 25 dB. So the table on the side shows notch depth 
trends. Uh, there were a series of papers that were published on notches on a similar VA data set, um, and they showed that left ear notches are more frequent and deeper than right ear notches, and bilateral notches are less common but deeper than unilateral. And so we see this same pattern throughout every single condition that we analyze. So now we're looking at three and six kilohertz notches. Um, and to remind you, the three kilohertz notch was present in about 3% of people, and the six kilohertz notch was present in about 6% of the people. So in looking at these figures just generally, I want you to think about if this patient came in, whether or not you would test um, the center frequency, because there's really no reason to believe maybe that they would have a notch at three or 6,000 hertz, because there's not a big difference between the two active frequencies. However, we do know that notch configurations can exist at three and six kilohertz, uh, but these frequencies often do go untested. But the presence of a notch, even with all other frequencies being normal, can still cause some hearing difficulty and noise. Okay, so in the beginning of the presentation, I posed the question, how important is the issue of audiologists having to diagnose and treat people with normal hearing? So the first thing that we have to do in asking this question is to find normal hearing in adults and have a really good understanding of how we got to that definition and whether or not it's a good definition to use. And after doing that, we can begin to understand the frequency in which normal hearing veterans are visiting an audiology clinic. Our prevalence rate, which was calculated from over 3 million audiograms, was 10%, uh, and so this is really quite high. And like I said, it's similar to the number reported in civilian populations. So next we looked at the rates of audiologic abnormalities in people with normal hearing. So across each of the tests performed, there were abnormal results. Uh, but more surprisingly, in this group of normal hearing veterans, 52% of them had at least one abnormal test result. So here I've listed some of the problems that can occur with um, abnormalities in their test results. And they can be present even within people with normal hearing. So very importantly, without a full evaluation, these problems and the specific audiometric configurations can go entirely unnoticed. So research on people with normal hearing is really becoming an increasing area of interest. Um, so this study may inform future research that investigates why people with normal hearing report some difficulties hearing and attempts to develop appropriate treatment options. Um, it may also encourage researchers and clinicians to think beyond only the audiogram when considering what constitutes normal hearing abilities. Okay, so I also did this project um, as part of my T35 program, so I wanted to thank the team at the NCRIR, um, my research advisor, Dr. Fowler, and my committee, Dr. Berlawler and Dr. Beath. Okay, any questions? Amy. <laughs> Yeah, but we had some bone. Okay. So we looked at airborne gaps, but we didn't have, um, we didn't plot the okay. average bone conduction so threshold. Like the data and mm -hmm. Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We didn't look at it um, isolated. We didn't look to see like if people with an airborne gap had uh, a higher rate of abnormal temps or anything like that, but that's a good idea. Yep. Were these um, active duty folks that you were looking at? No. There were no active duty people. Um, I'm not sure, but that'd be another nice thing to do. But there are some people looking into, uh, it's a different data set, but they're looking into people, active duty. Um, military people, and they're finding also that there's really a high rate of hearing difficulties, and they have a really nice comprehensive battery that they're using, so they're testing high frequencies, OAEs, um, and many other sorts of auditory processing. Anything else? Cool. Thank you.